Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. You can grab a seat and we're going to do things a little bit differently this morning. Thank you so much, Megan and team. And um, we're going to have some more worship towards the end of, of the service. So if you kind of were, man, I was just beginning to encounter God and I really enjoy worship. Why are we not worshiping this morning? No, we are going to worship a lot more, but just a little bit later. And I just want to perhaps share a few thoughts just around that as we sort of thinking about this whole idea of, of fasting and taking time out, dedicating ourselves to the Lord. And we're at such a great time at small group for the last while. I know some of our small groups haven't restarted and some of us aren't in small groups as such as yet. And just been inviting people to my house for that small group who aren't in a different small group. And just such a great time on Wednesday evening, praying together, worshiping together, just enjoying the Lord's presence. And for those of you who have been fasting with us this week, I've heard some great stories. And if you feel the Lord speaking to you, feel free, just think sometimes, even if it's something personal, until you want to just drop a message or let me know. It's just so encouraging. I, when, it's encouraging to hear when I know God is speaking to us, perhaps individually and definitely collective as well. I want to carry on around this theme of fasting and fasting in a New Testament sense, which we saw last week is a little bit different to Old Testament fasting. And I think last week we started by saying, if we think of the normal Christian life, what is it that a Christian does, how a Christian behaves? Obviously, there isn't a specific template. There's a uniqueness in every one of us that God has placed upon us. But there are certain behaviors, certain practices that we probably would mention. We'd mention prayer is probably important for a Christian. And we'd mention that possibly worship, giving, thanksgiving, these are all disciplines and actions which form part of a Christian life. And if we're growing as a Christian, we're hopefully growing in these areas. If there is somebody that we have begun to walk alongside and we're helping them grow as a believer, perhaps they've recently decided to follow Jesus, these are some of the things that we're going to be teaching them. And I wonder how many of us, even last week as I asked this question, said fasting. Fasting is central to a Christian lifestyle. And we saw last week that it is meant to be. I had a quote that I think it might be up on the screen in just a moment from Epiphanius, who was a bishop in the, the fifth century. And I love this quote just because of how it convicted me. He said, who does not know that the fast of the fourth and the sixth days of the week are observed by Christians throughout the world? And when I read that, I said, I do not know. I did not know that for centuries we see the same practice in the Didache, which was written sort of in the first century. And here in the fifth century, someone is still saying, everybody knows. The first day of the, or the, the third day of the week and the fifth day of the week, or the, sorry, the fourth and the sixth days of the week, those fast, Christians fast those days. It is part and parcel of the Christian life. And so we spoke about that last week. We saw all the way through to the Reformers, at least for Calvin and for Luther, they spoke, they assumed that fasting was part of the Christian life. In their writings and the way they spoke about it, it wasn't trying to encourage Christians to fast, but it was very similar to what we see sort of in, in Matthew when Jesus says, when you fast. Jesus doesn't take time saying you should fast. He's and kind of encouraging believers to fast. He says, when you fast, these are the things you should be paying attention to. Sort of the passage is framed within a, a when you pray, when you fast, when you give. In other words, these are things which we should be doing as Christians. And last week, we just reset that standard that fasting is normative and should be normative to the Christian life. And then last week, we focused quite a bit on this passage here in Matthew 9, when the disciples of John the Baptist, they came to Jesus and they asked him, why don't your disciples fast like the Pharisees do? 
And Jesus replied, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with a groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins, so that both are preserved. And we saw last week, we spent a little bit of time on this, that when Jesus came, He said, I, He is the bridegroom. He is the one, the one we've been waiting for. In the Old Testament, fasting was primarily centered on an invitation, a desperation for God to come. We even see that, that the New Testament starts with a story of fasting. Some have missed that. There was a lady called Anna, a prophetess, who had been fasting and praying. And then Jesus came in the midst of the same. There was a guy, Simon, who had been fasting and praying. And we see that right at the start of the New Testament, there is this fasting as a desire for God to come, a hunger for God to come. Even in general, or like we saw in some of the fasts, like some of Daniel's fasting and Esther's fasting, a desire for God to come and intervene. Jesus, we need you here in this moment. If you missed last or two weeks ago's message, it's on our podcast and our YouTube channel as well. You're welcome to download and have time, obviously, to re-share the whole message. But we saw that a, a new fasting is because, a new fasting, a new wineskin, is because our bridegroom has already come. It's pointless us now stepping out and fasting for the bridegroom to come because he's already come. Our fasting is now different. It is now because we have tasted because we have seen a glimpse of what it looks like when He comes, we are hungry for more. So it's, not a, it's very different to an Old Testament fast of God. You must come and intervene in this world. It's a God we have seen, and we love what we saw. A God we want more. Would the bridegroom come back? And so New Testament fasting is not like Old Testament fasting, which was often a, a fasting of desperation, of crying out. It's a fasting of victory. It's a fasting of overcoming, of freedom. It's a longing for more of what we have already tasted. And I mentioned three things that I believe for us as we go into this fast, we should trust God for, pray into, ask God about. The first one is that we should grow hungry for His presence, hungry for times with Him, hungry for waking up in the mornings and just saying, God, right now I am so hungry for breakfast or for coffee or for whatever it is, but I'm more hungry for You. So great, even just seeing my kids fasting, they've put two of them actually put up their hands as well, the third one decided not to, but two of them said they want to fast as well with us. And so for the month, they've each picked something and they're fasting and so great just having these conversations with them, being able to say that every time you have a need, a desire, you say, hey, I, right now that would be nice. To step back for a moment and to just ask, okay, God, you would be nicer. God, I, I want you, as much as I love that thing, there's nothing wrong with whatever it is, if you're fasting coffee or chocolate or meat or whatever it is that you have decided to fast for the month, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of those things. But God, you are better. And right now, God, I'm just choosing for a period to say, I would rather want you. Obviously, as an example that we always want to say that, but just to be deliberate for a time to say, God, I, I would rather want you. We want to be hungry for His presence. In one of the, sort of in, in the preparation, one of the things I read, which just so encouraged me about fasting, he, the author wrote that for us to fast, we don't need a crisis, just a longing. We saw Esther had a crisis, and that led to a fasting. But what if we fasted just because we had a longing for God? God, I don't have a crisis in my life right now. It's not that I need to stop, kind of, and God, you need to come right now and bring a breakthrough. God, I just have a longing for your presence. We said we want to be hungry for his leading, for his direction. We're going to look at one of those passages again in a little bit more detail this morning. We want to be directed for his purposes, whether individually in our families and the decisions we need to make in our careers, 
God, lead us, direct us. God, speak to us. God, we want to be led by you, God. We're hungry for your leading. We don't just want to trust in our own understanding and go in our own ways. God, we want to be led by you. So we want to be hungry for his presence, hungry for his leading, and hungry for his power. Hungry to see God be God in our lives, in our midst, in our communities again. Hungry to see God healing and restoring. Hungry to see God touching and making whole, turning hearts back to Him. And so that's all sort of just a little bit of a recap. I realize some of us weren't here two weeks ago. That's what we touched on and we spoke a little bit about two weeks ago. I want to go a little bit further building on that this morning and return to that passage in Acts chapter 13. And we read in, in Acts 13, this is this church in Antioch, and we have this church taking time out, seeking God's face. There's a church which is clearly a thriving church. They have a hunger for God. They step out. They put time aside, and they say, collectively, we are going to fast. We can just put an asterisk there. Jesus did say in one of the passages we read earlier that there is a reward to fasting. He said that when we fast, we mustn't fast like the Pharisees do in certain ways, but rather we must clothe ourselves properly and we must basically, in today's language, wash our face, you know, have a shower in the morning, put on deodorant, look like you're going through life joyfully. Don't walk around with this long hanging face and have everyone see how weak and how poor you are. You can do that if you want, Jesus says. And people will notice, and your reward will be the recognition of man. And if that's the reward you are after, you will get that reward. However, if the reward we are after is that God would see, then he says we should do it so that only he says. And so he says there, in a sense, we should keep it secret. But he isn't saying there that nobody may know that we are fasting. And here's a clear example. Here is a group of believers all fasting together. And I highly doubt that they were all fasting and nobody knew that the other one was fasting. I highly doubt they came together to pray and they were fasting and everyone individually by himself decided to fast and they never discussed it amongst themselves. So fasting, another quote that I saw in the preparation was so cool. He says, being seen fasting and fasting to be seen are not the same. So practically what I've just done over the years is I've try to embrace fasting as a, lifetime, as a lifestyle. Sometimes when I go and visit people and they want to, oh, they keep offering you something to drink. You know? Here, do you want coffee? No, do you want tea? No, do you want hot chocolate? Do you want Coke? Do you want water? And what, over and over. And, you know, that's a little bit awkward just saying no all the time. It's much easier to just say, no, thank you, I'm fasting today. Then the awkwardness is away. They understand they're not going to keep offering you stuff because we've got this in a hospitable culture. We want people to receive from us. And now it's so weird. He doesn't want to drink. Is something wrong with me? It's kind of, sometimes it's easier just to say no thanks. So we're saying that not to get recognition from them, but just purely because it makes life easier. And so Jesus definitely didn't put a prohibition and say, when you fast, nobody's ever allowed knowing that you are fasting. But he's saying, when you are fasting, are you doing it to get recognition from people, to be seen by people, or be to, to be seen by God? To be seen fasting is not the same as fasting to be seen. So let's not be afraid of being seen fasting, but let's trust God not to fa be fasting to be seen. Does that make sense? Okay. So we see this group here coming together, and they're fasting. They're fasting collectively, and among the prophets and the teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, who called the black man, and yeah, the new, we got the right translation, now we've got the wrong one here. Um, his name, they called him Niger, which is just Latin for Greek. Lucius, who was from Cyrene. Menaean, who was the childhood companion of King Herod, of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. And so one day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, we see here the first thing that I want us to realize this morning is that as part of their fasting, worship was part of it. It's interesting, as I was preparing for this message, I was 
looking for, for teaching, for kind of what have other people seen in these texts that we're missing, that can kind of build into, that can enrich our understanding a little bit. And it's amazing that two things that people picked up over the years. The first one is that in the last, probably longer than my lifestyle of my lifetime, and these are people who are a lot older than I writing most of these things, they say they have seen a, a regeneration in church of worship. And we've definitely seen that. I mean, when my parents were children, it was definitely not a situation where you would be able to listen to Christian music, authentic worship music on mainstream radio. And yet when I was a child many years ago, there were bands like Delirious and 363 who were being played on mainstream radio stations singing worship songs. And there was worship just as rejuvenation, a kind of a regeneration of worship. And we see that now that kind of you work in, we don't have CD shops anymore, but if you were to go into a CD shop today, there would be, in any secular CD shop, there would be probably Hillsong and Bethel and Elevation CDs freely available as part of not a replacing of worldly music, but God bringing that ministry back to the church. The other thing they've picked up is there has been, and I guess this probably was never lost, but there really was sort of a, a new wind into prayer within the church. It's like prayer, churches embraced prayer, and we had movements like the um, International House of Prayer and 24-7 prayer houses springing up all across the world. People saying, we want to pray. We believe in the power of prayer. And yet the one thing that doesn't seem to we have restored amongst these three as yet is fasting. That fasting hasn't become normative within the church again. Worship has become normative. Prayer has become normative. And I believe God is busy restoring the discipline and the lifestyle of fasting. And not only do I believe that many of these other writers who have watched sort of the growth of church over the years have picked up on this trend. But the other thing that was interesting is there was a lot of writing and a lot of teaching on Worship and prayer. There was a lot of writing and there's a lot of teaching on fasting and prayer. There is very little writing and teaching on worship and fasting. And that interaction and that combination, it's so interesting for me that as these groups came here, as this group came together, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Obviously, I hope we understand this and we try and teach this regularly from time to time. Worship is a lot more than music. Our musical expression is an expression of worship, but worship is so much broader than just our music. But yet, worship is also music. And the context that we see here and the way that it is written and sort of the st story around what is happening here at Antioch, it is clear that it's referring to worship in a musical sense. Coming together, singing and reading psalms and hymns and spiritual songs as Paul writes at some stage, coming together, experiencing the Lord, spending time pressing into His presence, worship. And we see here for this church in Antioch, this was part of their fasting. And so they're coming together, they're worshiping, and they are fasting. They are saying, God, we want to spend time in your presence and worship does that for us. Psalm 100 is such a beautiful psalm. A number of times in that psalm we read phrases like come into his presence with thanksgiving and with singing. Enter his courts with praise. The words we use in our singing brings us into the presence of the Lord. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. And so there's a place in our fasting, and we'll speak about prayer in just a moment, but there is a time and a place in our fasting where we worship deliberately. One of the things that's so important for me to see through all of these things is that I hope you've picked up by now, fasting doesn't happen by accident. Fasting doesn't just happen kind of, you know, maybe starving does, but fasting doesn't. Last week we said the difference between starving and fasting is fasting means we're engaging deliberately with the, with the Lord. Far, starving is we're just not eating. And in my younger years, before I found a wife, a good thing, I would often just forget to eat. Go through a day easily and come home, have breakfast, and 
just be working the whole day and come home the evening and realize I haven't eaten today yet, but then I found a wife and now I get food more regularly and that is absolutely amazing. Bless the Lord for marriage. But that's not fasting. Fasting is a deliberate pressing into God, a deliberate seeking His face. Prayer except in extreme circumstances like when your airplane is about to crash, probably doesn't happen by accident. Very few of us just accidentally end up praying. It's a deliberate interaction with God, as is worship. Worship is a deliberate interaction with God, and that's why even in our services, we want to invite all of us. You know, you can walk in here and I did this many times in my life as well, walk into a church service and worship is going on and people are worshiping, but I'm not. Maybe I'm singing, but I'm not worshiping. I'm not deliberately engaging with the Lord. And so worship requires us a deliberate stepping towards God to say, God, I want to step into your presence. And in just a moment, we're going to spend time a little bit, for, especially for those of us who are fasting, but all of us, just to take a moment in worship, and in fasting. A couple of things about this passage. Then we just finish reading, and then we'll speak a little bit more about worship. One day, as the men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, God speaks to us, and that's the point of worship and fasting. It is to allow us to sit at God's feet. Prayer, and we see this, often flows out of our worship and our fasting. Because I believe biblical prayer, some of us may change, might not quite agree with this, but a large, not always, but a large part of biblical prayer, God speaks first, not us. So often we come into prayer and we set the agenda and we start speaking. Sometimes our prayer needs to be a little bit less, God, here is the agenda of what we need to pray about today, what we need to speak about today, and a little bit more of, God, what is your agenda about what we need to speak about today. And that's a hard thing to do because we don't always like his agenda. Just in this week, we've been, just for our national apostolic team, we've been wrestling through some of the more uncomfortable sayings of Jesus. How do we bring those corporately and pastorally into our church family? What do we teach about that? And as I'm wrestling through this, I'm thinking kind of probably in the next few months, we're going to probably do a series On Jesus, I call them his Aina sayings. Those words that he speaks that I don't like hearing. It's not nice hearing Jesus say those things. Jesus, if it was up to me, I would have us approach the situation different. And then to realize it's not up to me. That Jesus said some things which, if you want to take them this way, can be very offensive. And then what do I do? Do I surrender to him? Do I allow him to set the agenda. When Jesus begins to speak into my life, it's not always comfortable. I think it's um, Tim Keller who says that if your God never disagrees with you, you are, not, you are only worshiping an idealized version of yourself. If your God never disagrees with you, if you're never sitting in a prayer time and God speaks to you and you don't like what God is saying, or God corrects you, Or God says, that thing in your life, we need to change that. If those moments don't happen, you're probably only worshiping an idealized version of yourself. So they're praying, they're taking time in worship to draw near to God. As they draw near to God, God speaks to them. The Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I've called them. And so after more fasting and prayer, more fasting, they're continuing to fast. They're praying now. Now their response, their worship was, God, speak to us. The response is, okay, God, now we speak to you. After more fasting and prayer, they lay hands. God, we want to make sure we're hearing you right. God, this is what we think you are saying. Is this what you are saying? God, if this is what you're saying, what does this look like? God, are we getting the whole picture? One of the mistakes we too often make as Christians is we hear the first sentence of what God has said. We think we've heard the whole message and we run with that. Instead of stopping and allowing God to expand. God, do we, are we actually hearing you right? God, this is what we hear you are saying. Is this what you are saying? 
No, no, Philip, it's not at all what I'm saying. Okay, God, help me to help you, to hear you better. Pray more. Wrestle with God. After more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them, a little bit like we did with Deirdre this morning, laid hands on them and sent them on their way. A couple of things from this text. Firstly, it's clearly a corporate fast. They're fasting together. They're not hiding from one another that they are fasting. Second, I've mentioned this is they start with worship. Worship as we are fasting is important. Perhaps even we should say that we must worship first. Before we rush into the presence of God, I don't think this always applies. I don't think this is sort of a ritualistic formula. There are times when we just speak to God. There are times when we wake up in the middle of the night and we just pray and prayer flows out or when we're driving in our car. But there is also an understanding that when we come into God's presence, we come with reverence. And worship helps with that. There are a couple of things that worship does. We don't have time, unfortunately, this morning to unpack all of this theologically, but I just want to sort of share these thoughts with us because there's another passage on fasting I'd love for us to look at before we spend some time together in worship. The first thing is that worship elevates God in our thoughts. It reminds us who He is. We sing a song which is actually technically more of a praise song this morning, like King of Majesty. It's a way of, we're not singing King of Majesty to remind God that He is the King of Majesty. We're singing King of Majesty to remind me that He is the King of Majesty. We're not saying, God, I have one desire just to meet with you because God doesn't know what the desires of our hearts are. We are saying that to establish that desire, to remind ourselves that, God, as I come here this morning, this should be my one desire. Maybe in the car driving here, I had a bunch of desires. I wanted to speak to this person. I wanted to have a good cup of coffee. I wanted to hear that. I wanted this breakthrough at work. I wanted an answer about this. Wait, God, I have one desire, just to be with you. And worship sort of creates that place where it elevates God in our thoughts. It reminds us who He is. Some of us miss this about worship. I love this about well-written worship songs. It's a confession of truth and a means of engaging with Scripture. Learned this many years ago that very few of us in the car today on the way home are going to be reciting Scripture. Some of you incredible saints would be. You're going to be taking one or two of these Scriptures we look today, and you're going to be meditating on them, reciting them, discussing them between you and the husband or wife, whoever's in the car with you and the friend, over lunchtime talking about the text. Most of us aren't, if we're totally honest, unless in our study time that we set aside. But probably at least one of us, we're going to get in our car a little bit later and drive home and sing one of the songs, even quietly that we were singing in church. While we're walking a little bit later, or you're washing the dishes, or you're sitting having your meal, the melody of one of the songs is going to come up, perhaps the chorus. And we don't even realize that if we are singing good, theologically accurate songs, we are engaging with the Word, even as we are singing. We sang, some of us probably haven't, maybe we have because we're fasting, prayed the Lord's Prayer in this week. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Many of us probably haven't deliberately sat and done that, but just a little bit earlier, all of us prayed that prayer. Let your kingdom come, Lord. As we sang that song, we engaged with the text. Worship as a way of bringing us back to the, to the text, and that's one of the reasons, and our worship leaders would tell you about this, where we're very deliberate about the songs we sing. There are a whole bunch of of really great Christian songs that we don't sing in this environment. Not because they are wrong or because they are bad, but because they don't contribute to good theology and a good understanding of who God is. In that sense, how singing good worship songs, it's not a replacement of Bible study. It's not a replacement of reading, but it is a way for us to confess truth and to engage with Scripture. Worship recenters us. I find this to be true in my life. Worship as a way of bringing me back to true north, of calibrating my inside. Worship as a way of, you know, when there's a storm raging outside and kind of a thousand things happening in our lives, 
worship as a way of just bringing that back again. Just recentering, recalibrating. And then worship quietens our raging souls. All of those voices, all of the shouting and the screaming on the inside, worship is a way of, like David, be still, my soul. It quietens our raging souls. And the great thing about quieting our souls is it sensitizes us. Worship sensitizes us to the voice of the Lord. To me, it's no coincidence that this group was worshiping, and as they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke. They were worshiping. They were bringing themselves to a place of surrender. They were bringing themselves to a place of listening, a place of hearing who God is. So tomorrow evening, we're going to do this in just a moment. Tomorrow evening, it's the first Monday of the month. Just as part of our culture, what we try and do is on the first Monday of every month, come together to worship and to pray. And Some people wonder why we do it in that format. This is part of why we do it. So tomorrow evening, I want to invite you. Come and join us here at half past six. and It will be a time of worship and fasting. and Out of that, a time of prayer. Come and join us for that. And perhaps even in our small groups this week, as a template for us to take time to worship, to surrender, to recenter, to allow worship to quiet our raging souls. And so as we worship, out of that flows prayer. We're going to do that in, in just a moment, but sort of as a, a B part of this morning, as we're just continuing thinking around fasting, I want us to read another text about fasting. I know the Guys who teach us about preaching say we should never do this, but I'm going to do this anyway. I'm going to have two different messages, but connected on the same morning. And I hope you all, I don't hope, I know you are all more than intelligent enough to stay with me. So part A was about the importance of worship during our fasting. That worship, drawing near to God, listening to God, singing unto Him, prepares us to hear Him. And part of our fasting, we should embrace worship. Then I want us to read from one of probably the most famous fasts in Scripture. It's found in Daniel chapter 10. It's not the first time Daniel fasts. We know he's fasted at least once before this with his friends. And now at the beginning of the book of Daniel, and now at the end of the book of Daniel, Daniel in a sense is bookended by two fasts. Daniel fasts again. And we read from verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, who was also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future times of war and great hardship. When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time, I had fasted. I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. Daniel here is clearly fasting. It's interesting for me that during his fasting, his spirit man is awakened. This vision doesn't come at some random time. This vision comes at the end of a prolonged period of fasting. Some of us, as we go through our day-to-day lives, we forget that we are spirit beings living in a natural world that there is a spiritual dimension all around us that we don't always see and we're not always aware of. And fasting, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago as well, fasting helps us, it reminds us that there is a spiritual. But not only does it remind us, fasting awakens our spirits. On the 23rd of April, as I was standing on the, break, the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and I saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Here we see Daniel seeing in the Spirit. He sees a vision. We're going to read in the the next verse, but I just want to highlight this now. The people around him, they don't see this vision. They're not fasting. Their spirits aren't awakened. It's amazing to me that when Jesus starts his ministry, what is the very first thing he does? The Holy Spirit leads him 
into a desert to fast for 40 days. He goes and he fasts for 40 days and in that process, sort of, he ends with three passages from Deuteronomy and there's just a beautiful teaching caught up in all of that great parallels between the manna that was given and Jesus' answers were all in the context of the manna that was given to the people of Israel as they were in this desert for 40 years. Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days. And all of his answers were based on what the people of Israel had learned during their 40-year fast. And they cried out to God and they said, God, we need food. God, what are we going to eat? And God, every day, gave them food. And at the end, he said, I did this to teach you that you are not only going to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from my mouth. And that's one of the answers that Jesus gives at the end of his time of fasting. Jesus awakens his spirit. During his time of fasting, fasting leads us to surrender. Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing. They were suddenly terrified and they ran away to hide. They realized something was happening, but they didn't have a clue what. And so they ran away to hide. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left me. My face grew deathly pale and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak and when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. One of the things that fasting leads us to is to surrender. Fasting brings us to a place where we don't have strength in ourselves anymore. And what I've learned is when my body doesn't have strength so much, my emotions don't have so much strength. And my fighting with God becomes a little bit less fighting with God and more surrender to God. My spirit yields easier when I've been fasting. It's easier for me to, God, I don't have strength for this today. Okay, God, I'm going to surrender. God, would you be my strength? And so fasting leads us to surrender. It leads us to yielding. I believe that surrender and yielding are one of the key aspects to our being led by the Spirit. It is impossible for us to be led by the Spirit if we haven't come to a place of surrender. I think this is one of the reasons why Jesus fasted for 40 days. He had to come to a place in His natural person. Because let's remember, yes, He was perfectly the Son of God, but He was also perfectly the Son of Man. He needed to come to a place where He was surrendered in his humanness, so that right at the end of his life, he can pray and he can say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And I've realized in my life of fasting, fasting brings me to that place of surrender a little bit easier. When I'm not fasting, it's easy to fight with God. When we, towards, towards the end of a time of fasting, it's easier just to say, okay, God, you have said, God, I will follow you. God, I will embrace you. Fasting leads us to yielding, to surrender. As an aside, that's a little bit of what worship is as well. Don't know when last you watched the war movie, but one of the postures you often see in a war movie is people raising their hands like this when someone's pointing a gun at them. Why do we raise our hands? We don't raise our hands to draw attention in that context. We raise our hands to say, I'm unarmed. I'm giving up. I've got nothing left. And as we raise our hands in worship, that's a little bit of what we're saying. God, I surrender. God, I'm giving over. God, I'm letting go of all of these things, the weapons. I'm putting them all down. And I'm saying, God, your way. Whatever you say to me now, that's what I'm going to do. You're the one, and this Jesus is not the one pointing a gun in my face. So don't misunderstand that. But in a war movie context, you're the one pointing the gun at me, so you get to make the instructions. We surrender to God. God, you are the king of majesty. So you're the one making instructions. Just then, uh, continuing in Daniel, just then a hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. The man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up for I've been sent to you. When he said this to me, I stood up. Still trembling. Fasting brings comfort and encouragement. 
Fasting brings us to a place where we can experience the encouragement, the love of God, the comfort of God spoken over our lives. Fasting brings us to where Daniel is weak, surrendered on his face. And what does God, this angel in this context say? Okay, now stand up. God really loves you. God really loves you. God isn't angry with you. You don't have to run away. We see the same with um, John on the Isle of Patmos. He sees this angel and he falls to his knees, his face as if dead. And the angel picks him up and says, no, stand up. Behold, there is a one who has overcome and who conquers and encourages him around. And Jesus picks him up at some stage as well. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I have the keys of life and of death. Fasting brings brings us to the place of surrender and then allows us to experience God's comfort. Something else that fasting does in that time of comfort sometimes is it exposes our hearts. Fasting, you know, when I'm fasting, at the end of my fasting, I get really irritated or I get really hangry or just don't have time for people or my fuse is really short. There's not Christ-likeness coming out of me. What does that do? It means fasting is just highlighting what's on the inside still of who I am as a human. Okay, God, I can surrender. God, I shouldn't be this way. Just in this week, I was really tested in this, and I don't think I quite got a full marks out of this, but I was encouraged by my reaction. These chairs we're sitting on, the black ones in front are all new chairs, and we had a whole bunch of other chairs we've been selling little by little. And so Wednesday, we're fasting, and Wednesday, I had meetings literally the whole day from just after seven until half past five. Finally, half past five, we're done, and some guys say they want to come buy some of the old chairs that we're selling. And they arrive here to buy the chairs. I'm tired. Tell them the price. And now they want to start negotiating and this and this and whatever. I say, but this is the price. And these guys are trying to think of every scheme. And I'm tired. <laughs> I need to go prepare for small groups all tonight. Get everything ready. And now these guys are really testing my patience. And I'm not very patient in that moment. Fortunately, I said it, not a 9 out of 10, definitely not a 10 out of 10, but a lot better than I, I think I would have been a year ago. I was able to say to them with a smile, so guys, I really don't have time for this. Here are the chairs. If you would like to buy the chairs, you are welcome to buy the chairs. Then buy the chairs. If you do not want to buy the chairs, then you don't have to buy the chairs. No one is forcing you to buy the chairs. And I could say that, and I think in a good demeanor, and I was encouraged by how God has helped me to grow in patience. Because I know a year ago, I probably would have snapped at those people. And fasting highlighted that there's still an area I need to grow in, but I'm a little bit better, I think, than I was previously. Fasting exposes our heart. It brings out what's hidden deep on the inside. And it leads us to this place of surrender. I think I've got these notes under the wrong heading. To this place of, I am not. I am not perfect. My answers aren't right. God, I'm going to surrender to you. I can imagine Saul and Barnabas fasting and coming to the place of surrender. And God says to them, okay, now leave this place and go out into a place. Travel the world. Oh, God, but I've just bought a house. God, I've just found this woman. God, I've just... My child has just been born. God, I've just started a new job. God, I've just, God speaks to them. And their response is one of surrender. And then fasting brings comfort. It brings encouragement. I love this in verse 12. Then this angel says to Daniel, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. Fasting is an expression of humility. Fasting, as I said earlier, it doesn't happen by accident. Fasting isn't something that we just stumble upon. Fasting is a deliberate decision to say, God, I want to be humble before you. God, I want to humble myself. God, I want to lift you up. I want to exalt you a little bit. I guess like John the Baptist says, God, more of you, less of me. I must decrease. God, you must increase. And fasting is, in a sense, an 
embracing of being humble. Fasting doesn't suddenly make us humble, but fasting is one way of saying, God, I embrace humility. God, I choose to say that you are more worthy. God, not my will, but your will be done. Daniel, since the first day, you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself. Fasting is one way in which we can humble ourselves before the Lord. And then the last point for us this morning, we're going to have communion together and then we're going to worship together. Fasting not only awakens our spirit, fasting is a way in which we engage with the spirit. Watch this crazy sequence of events. So Daniel begins to pray. Daniel begins to fast. As Daniel begins to fast, he sets off a sequence of events in the heavenly realms that he would have not have a clue about if his angel didn't speak to him. I believe something similar to this happens when we pray and when we fast, except just we don't know about it, so we don't know what is happening. But watch this. It's the very next verse. So, I have come in answer to your prayer, and then he carries on. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. So what's happening here is this angel wants to come and answer Daniel's prayer as he steps out. As Daniel begins to pray, the spirit prince comes to begin to answer his prayer. But there's a prince of Persia who opposes him, who somehow in the heavenly realm says, wait, you can't get past here to go and speak to Daniel to bring him the answers. All of this is kicked off by Daniel's fasting. This kingdom prince of Persia blocks my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. So there's some help, some warfare, some we don't quite know exactly what help, what form this help takes, but this archangel is sent to come and help this angel get past the prince of Persia to bring to pass his purpose that needs to happen that started with Daniel's prayer and with Daniel's fasting. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So this kind of, he just tagged him, you know. This angel says to Michael, Michael, you take care of this angel, with this prince of Persia. I'm going to carry on on my route. A couple of verses later in verse 20, this angel again replies, do you know why I have come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So he has to go back that way, and that prince is still there, so Michael hasn't killed him yet. And we don't know how these things work. My point is simply that in our fasting, we engage with a dimension that we don't normally consider. After the spirit prince, that the kingdom of Greece will come. So not only am I going to fight against the prince of Persia, then I have to go and fight against the prince of Greece. Meanwhile, I'll tell you what's written in this book of truth. And then no one, kind of as an aside, no one helps me against these spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. I have been standing beside Michael to support and strengthen him since the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. And so what we get a little bit of insight here into is what's happening in the heavenly realms over nations. We see here that Michael is the spirit prince of what seems to be the people of Israel. We see that there is a prince of Greece and his prince of Persia. And there's this war going on and there's all of this stuff going on over nations. And somehow David fasting sets off a sequence of events in those realms. I wonder how often when we fast, when we pray, we're looking beyond just two or three meters that we can see, figuratively speaking, in our lives. And we're asking God to open our eyes. God, just give us a glimpse. God, give us an understanding that what we're doing here, God, goes so far beyond the room we are praying in. God, that somehow our worship affects the spirit realms. For some of us, it's an awareness just again that, God, there is a spirit realm. God, that there are kings and kingdoms. God, there are entire nations, Lord God, who in a sense, in the spirit, are at war with one another, ideologies that are clashing. The Bible speaks about this at length in Corinthians as well. Powers and principalities and kingdoms of darkness. 
warring against one another. And so when we're upset about a decision that a leader has made over our nation, I wonder how many times we just get angry with the leader who's made that decision or how often are we willing to step back and to say, whoa, God, is there a war in the spirit here? Are there kingdoms and princes, as we see here, fighting against one another? Lord, is there something happening in the spirit which is simply manifesting through this person? Because doesn't Jesus say our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities? Again, the kingdom of darkness that rule over nations in different places. and says, are we willing to engage with them? And fasting helps us in some sense to engage in that dynamic. I don't think fasting is the only way, but it does seem when David, or when Daniel started to fast, something shifted in the spirit. And so I want to encourage us in our fasting, let's up our expectation of to meet with God. Let's say, God, we're going to start in our fasting. We're going to take time to worship, to quiet our souls and our spirits, to hear, to recenter ourselves so that we can listen to you. And God, as we do that, God, would you open our eyes to the Spirit? God, would you allow us to see more than what's just happening in the natural, in the streets around us, Lord, in our communities, in our families, over our cities, over our workplaces? God, what is the spiritual dynamic that is going on here? Because, God, we need to step into and engage with that. One of the reasons why we pray in the Spirit, some of us have neglected praying in the Spirit. One of the reasons we need to pray in the Spirit, Paul says to us, because in the Spirit we speak mysteries. In other words, we are speaking things our spirit man understands, but our mind doesn't. We can pray into these situations where these angels are actively engaged with and doing whatever the angels need to do around that because our minds cannot be understanding, but our spirits can. And those are times when Paul says, I will pray with a spirit and I will pray with my understanding. Yes, there are times when we pray with our understanding, but there are times when we pray with our spirit. There are times when we sing with our understanding and there are times when we sing with the spirit. And perhaps this morning, if you have not yet been filled with the spirit of God, we want to pray with you so that you can receive that ability to do that, to pray in the Spirit, to pray in ways in which your mind doesn't understand, but in which your spirit is engaging, in which we're saying, God, let your kingdom come. Lord, let your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to ask the band to step forward again, and as they come forward, if Sarah and maybe one or two people can hand her, just help her just to hand out the elements of communion. We're going to take communion together as we remind ourselves that in all of these battles, in all of the spirit, Jesus has overcome. It's amazing to me that Jesus fasts, and at the end of the fast, he has his most clear confrontation with the devil on this earth. Yes, he's confronting devils and demons throughout his whole life. But here is this moment at the end of his fast where he's engaging with the Spirit. Where the devil is appearing to him and he's speaking to the devil and he's wrestling with his desires and his humanhood and the Spirit. And he's wrestling in the Spirit. And his place of yieldedness, his place of surrender has empowered him to overcome. And as we do that, as we engage in the Spirit, as we invite the Spirit to speak to us, to lead us, to direct us, we remind ourselves that we are fasting not because we are awaiting a bridegroom, but we are fasting because the bridegroom has come. We are fasting because His body is broken and because His blood is shed. We are fasting because He has already overcome the powers and the principalities. We don't, like Daniel, have to fast in the hope of victory. We can fast in the knowledge of victory. We can fast because whatever it is that is highlighted in my life as I fast, whether it is anger or frustration, whether it is impatience, whether it is carnality or just not able to trust in God but trusting in my own mind, whether it's a desire for earthly wealth and earthly riches, 
whatever it is, God, all of those things you have overcome. So I can surrender them to you. That Jesus, your blood is sufficient, Lord. You have washed us clean. That any sin I can possibly think of, God, right now, it is nailed to the cross and the price is paid. Every single sin. If you're here this morning and you're still struggling with shame, with guilt of sin, I'm not saying that we don't know that we have sinned, we're aware of our sin and we thank God for our forgiveness. But if you're still struggling just with the reality of sin in your life, it feels like there's no victory. You can't get away from it. This morning, we want to pray with you because the blood of Jesus is sufficient. The bridegroom has come. Your fasting doesn't have to be a fasting of God, please forgive me. It's a fasting of God, thank you that I am forgiven. And so this morning, if that's you, while we are worshiping in just a moment, while we are praying, I want to invite you to step forward. We want to pray with you. Trust God to breathe life and hope and freedom over you, to set you free from the law of sin and death, to bring you into a life of grace and truth that He holds before us. The cross is sufficient. As the band members are receiving the elements of the communion, I want to encourage you, don't you just right there where you are, take a moment and bring yourself and your life before the Lord. Thank Him for His breakthrough. Thank Him for His mercy and for His grace, His truth. Thank Him for the power of the cross in your life. Perhaps there's an area where You need to see just the victory of the cross just shining its light, breaking the power of darkness right now as well. Just bring that before the Lord and say, God, thank you that what you have done is enough. was broken. Thank you, God, that as you did that, Lord, you took every power and every principality and you made a public spectacle on them. You shamed them. You embarrassed them, Lord God, because you overcame their strongest. You overcame their biggest weapon, Lord. You overcame their last hope. You destroyed death so that we can have life. You broke the power of sin, Lord, You cut off its chains and its shackles. And so right now, Jesus, we want to thank you that your body was broken so that we can have victory. Thank you, Jesus, that as the bridegroom, you have come and we could see a glimpse of who you are. Let's eat together. And Jesus, thank you that even as your body was broken, that your blood was shed, And that your blood is sufficient for every single sin, Lord. There is no sin in any of our lives which is stronger than your blood, Lord God. That your blood washes further than the east is from the west. That's how far you have removed our transgressions from us, Lord God. And so right now, we just step into that again. We embrace that. We receive that further than the east is from the west, Lord. We receive forgiveness just anew. We receive breakthrough. We receive overcoming grace to walk in that which you have called us to walk in. Let's drink together. I've asked the band to lead us in a a time of worship. I want to encourage you, please don't run away as yet. Hang around for a few moments and, and worship. Allow the Lord just to quieten your soul. Allow Him to speak to you. As I mentioned, tomorrow evening we're going to be coming back and we're going to have a little bit more time to do this. Join us for that if you can. We'll start at half past six. In your small groups this week, take time to worship and surrender before the Lord. And many can stand as we worship together.
Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash Pretoria. <laughs>